Du sein kannst, sondern das die Gott hat. Okay, as you look this over, there's only one great question, of course, whether or not this advances what we've already read, and in what way does it advance or go beyond what we've done? So please take a look. Right. That's, if you can afford to pay the full price, pay the full price. But it's a very worthy cause. But. Pierre has a regular column in the magazine. So, big draw. Thank you. <clears throat> Just thought I'd go over the obvious for a few moments, okay? Would you agree there's something interesting about the model of perception? There's the seer, there's the activity of seeing, and the object seen. But would you agree you never see the seeing? And as far as the seer, you know it by knowing its objects, but not itself. And the, whatever is seen, curiously enough, is always different from the seeing and the seer. Therefore, creates a kind of puzzle. I mean, how can we be sure there's a seeing if we've never seen it? We infer it. There must be. And there has to be one of these things, the seer, because after all, we're doing the seeing. Therefore, we are in fact a seer, right? right? But we don't get a chance to see it. Right? Just let me make sure that's correct. Barbara? <laughs> yes. Good. Now, notice now, the same game in philosophy, the seer, the intellect, intellecting, the intelligible. But in this model, while you can make these distinctions, no difference. While you can make these distinctions, there's no difference. So this is a dynamic, it's not dead, the 
seen is always dead. Right? You're always looking at the surface of things. You're never looking at the thing itself, right? You're only, you can look at someone, ah, dead skin, that's what you're looking at. Right? <clears throat> Except when we have a friend of ours who's willing to give himself an open cut so we can take a look at something other than dead skin on the surface, right? You got I have one. You have one. She has one too in case you want to see. Look here. This intelligible is dynamic, turning upon itself. See? It's turning upon itself, sometimes called uh, in Plato and in the Phaedrus, the pure light. Luminous. So there is a seeing, there's something seeing. You, one is aware that it is turning upon itself, seeing itself, turning upon itself, seeing. No difference. Now, he doesn't use this word. I, that's, I made that up, okay. So, he, he will often call this uh, the intellectual intelligible. Right. Combining these two for this. And that's this. Right. <clears throat> so the whole Phaedrus is nothing other than trying to say what happens when someone experiences this. That's the whole Phaedrus. So he's going to introduce a myth. He's going to introduce all kinds of strange metaphysics to talk about that experience. Now, radiance. And he uses a very important word for all of Plato. That this experience, wow. All right. Beauty. Hey, intelligible. Oh, good heavens, mind. It's not dumb, right? Nothing can be considered more real than that. It truly is. It has a uh, dynamic or vitality to it. And therefore, this can also, since it truly is, that's the basis for saying it is true or truth. So look here, see, why doesn't he leave it alone? Yeah, why doesn't he leave it alone? But instead, he's going to give us a whole myth about what it's like trying to get to it, what happens when you get it, and the return. See, that's what he's doing. How do you get it? Once you get it, the return. What else you have to do? So he's adding to this experience itself words with things like, how do you get it? Worse, better than that, he has to explain why you are not seeing it. Since it's, in a, it's the nature of reality of which we are part. And this takes on the form of why are you not seeing the obvious? Because when, you, when this is experienced, you recognize central to this is 
it is uh, there is no ego personal self perhaps only the self to the top of the list, right? Because you're there, but you're not there like this. Okay, so huh, if that's that's the self, how come you're so stupid you're not seeing the obvious, right? So he has to explain that. So he has to explain why you're not seeing the obvious, what to do to see it, to be there, right? and the experience itself, and most importantly, what follows from it. That's where we're going. Now, Proclus is taking this and he's saying, okay, I'm going to put this in mythical language I'm going to put mythical language. And after I make my distinctions, I'm going to take the distinctions and structure it out in such a way to fit into a comprehensive metaphysics. That's what you're going to do. So, why don't we uh, get a couple of sections to read and jump in and uh, take a look. Is that fair? Anything? Okay, look here. Oh. Want to read my notes? Let's go. <laughs> this, this book, of course, comes from uh, uh, Rod's great collection in the old days when we used to have to photocopy all of these books and bind them together and right, right, right. So that's why mine is somewhat different than yours. Um, so why don't we just take a couple of just a couple of pages and. Okay, wait a minute. Um, <clears throat> intellect, because it sees. <laughs> see, it's it's a seeing. So, one, one, two, essence. Right. Right. central to it and he takes this dynamic and vitality and he's going to put those two together and that's going to be for him life okay so just to make sure we have the same vocabulary. Um, oh, this is why he always talks about uh, triads. Uh, if you want to see it, uh, intellect is the seeing, right? <coughs> It's an activity, 
right? It's an act dynamic activity. So you can do it in a variety of ways, but essentially, uh, whatever, whatever is must have a power of activity, and from that activity, an activity, I mean, from that power, an activity. And these are, therefore, the triad, the un fundamental triads in all of Proclus's writings, especially uh, Thomas Taylor as well. Okay. The triadic hypotheses. So why don't we uh, get into, <clears throat> but say we get into uh, uh, chapter four. Okay, four or five. Again, however, returning to Plato, let us accord with him and exhibit the science which pre-exists with him concerning each of these triads. Right. Triads. Right. <clears throat> in the first place, let us assume what is written in the Phaedrus. Survey from the words themselves of Socrates, how he unfolds to us the whole of the orderly distinction of these triads and the differences which it contains. All right. What are you going to do? This is fundamental. This is fun triad. All right. Once you see this, then you can stick in these three if you want, or these three, or any number of triadic arrangements, and he's going to go through a whole bunch of them, isn't he? The Phaedrus. Therefore, there are said to be twelve leaders who preside over the whole of mundane concerns and who conduct all the mundane gods and all the herds of demons and convert them to the intelligible nature. It's also said that Zeus is a leader of all of these twelve gods that he drives a winged chariot, adorns and takes care of all things and brings all the army of gods that follow him. The first indeed, first indeed to the place of survey within the heavens, to the blessed spectacles and discursive energies of the intelligibles which are there. In the next place Zeus brings them to the sub-celestial ark which proximately be, begirds the heavens and is contained in it after this to the heaven itself and the back of heaven where also divine souls stand and being born along together with the heavens survey all the essence that is beyond it. Socrates further adds that prior to the heaven there's what is called the super celestial place in which true and real essence, the plane of truth, the kingdom adrastia, <coughs> and the divine choir of virtues subsist. And that souls being nourished through the intellection of these monads are happily affected. That's the whole thing. Now from now on, from now on he's going to take each one of these and talk about them. So that's the summary. Right. It's necessary, however, prior to other things to consider what the heaven is of which Socrates speaks and in what order of things it is established. For having discovered this, we may also survey the sub-celestial arc and the super-celestial place. For each of these is assumed according to habitude towards the heavens, the one indeed being primarily placed above it but the other being primarily arranged under it. Right, so, got that paragraph? That's the general. Got the general? All right, what do we want to talk about? Heaven. 
super and subs. Right. What order of beings it is established? Then survey the sub-celestial and the supra-celestial place. So what's he got? He's got I had the sub celestial below it, but turn, turn it around. Oh, that's okay. Okay, I'll do it that way. That's all you got. <coughs> now, let's see what do you got. What do you do? It's a map. You're building a map. That's all you're doing. You're building a map and you're filling in stuff. That's all. The first thing he has to talk about is why use this term, heaven. So what do you have to use that for? A curious word. Curious play. What therefore is the heaven which uh, Zeus uh, leads the gods? Ah. this represent the twelve gods into the heavens? <clears throat> now, he's got a very important sentence in this that I thought I'd hit. <clears throat> Even a partial soul, when perfected, is conversant with sublime concerns and governs the whole world. So, Zeus and all the gods are, as it were, suspended, tied together, brought together. How is it possible, therefore, that the leaders of whole souls should be converted to the sensible heaven and exchange the intelligible place of survey for an inferior allotment when through these souls they preside over the universe in order they may illuminate mundane natures with a liberated and unrestrained power?
Okay. What's the whole game? This is saying that uh, even even partial souls who play this game, if they're caught up in this and gain heaven, then they join the order of all beings, preside, gain power. Right, that's it. True. Uh, they're liberated, preside with uh, being liberated. And of course, later we want to know. Is he saying, going back to our image, is he saying that when this is experienced, the Susia, that's what he's talking about for souls? Then they gain a certain power, they're liberated, and then in one sense they preside and have some co-joining with heaven. See, what's interesting uh, is uh, see, there's earth, heaven, this kind of heaven, and man is between the two. And what he's saying is that, hey, we have to become we have to become liberated from one and join the other. And if so, then you are kingly, right? Kingly. Sovereign. That's the... And therefore have necessarily a certain kind of power, right? Being liberated in this process. And now, he's going to say, hey, you know what? You can take all beings, all people, right? And you can line them up after Zeus, and these are the 12 gods, and each one of these has a special uh, state of mind. And each one of these Olympian gods represents a different state of mind, and therefore all people can be said to be broken up in these 12 categories, and they are all at one key point when you drop dead. But this whole journey is when you drop dead, you know. Well, this is a, and some people can drop dead before they're buried according to Barbara. That's true. True. Jump in. Okay, I have said enough. <laughs> For in short, the gods know sensibles, not by conversion to them, but by containing in themselves the causes of them. Hence, intellectually perceiving themselves, they know sensibles causally and rule over them, not by looking to them and verging to the subjects of their government, by converting through love inferior natures to themselves. Right? That's the goal. Right? Therefore, uh, I'll enjoy someone else reading for a while. Neither, therefore, is it lawful for the gods to adorn the whole of heaven. Think it worthy. Think it worthy their providential care to be ever situated under the circulation of this heaven. Nor is there any blessedness in the contemplation of things which exist under it. Nor souls that are converted to this contemplation among the number of those that are happy that follow the gods, but they rank among those that exchange intelligible for opinions or doxatic nutrient. 
Uh, such as Socrates says, the souls that are lame, they've broken their wings, they're, they're in a merged condition. So therefore, we're jumping up in the next paragraph, farther still. How about a reader? Jump? Try it. Since therefore passions of this kind belong to partial souls, and these are these not such as are happy. Oh, I know you skipped it. How can we refer a conversion to the sensible heaven to the ruling and leading God? Further still, Socrates says that souls standing on the back of the heaven are carried round by the circumvolution itself of the heaven. But Timaeus and the Athenian guests say that souls lead everything in the heavens by their own motions, externally cover bodies with their motions, and living their own life through the whole of time, impart to bodies secondarily efficient powers of motion. How therefore do these bodies secondarily efficient powers of motion. No, wait a minute. How, how therefore do these things accord with those who make the seven to be sensible? For souls do not contemplate and dance round intelligible through the circulation of the heavens, but through the unapparent convolution of souls, bodies revolve in a circle, and about these perform their circulations. If therefore anyone should say that the sensible heaven circumvolves souls, and that it is divided according to the back, the profundity, and the subcelestial arch, many absurdities must necessarily be admitted. Okay, that's rather important, right? You're saying, hey, you know, all of this uh, motion that we're talking about, hey, it's in the soul, it's within you. Right, it's within you. And therefore, he's going to correct that. Another reader, jump in. You're next. But if someone should say that the heaven is intelligible, to which Zeus is the leader, but all the gods, and together with these daimons, follow him, he will unfold the divinely inspired narrations of Plato consentaneously to the nature of things and will follow the most celebrated of his interpreters. For Plotinus and Iamblichus are of opinion that this heaven is a certain intelligible. And prior to these, Plato himself in the Cratylus following the Orphic Theogonies calls the father indeed of Zeus Kronos, but of Kronos Uranus. And he evinces that Zeus is the demiurgus of the whole of things through the names by which he is called, investigating for this purpose the truth concerning them. But he shows that Saturn is connective of a divine intellect and that heaven is the intelligence or intellectual perception of the first intelligibles. For sight, says he, looking to the things above is heaven. Hence, heaven subsists prior to every divine intellect. With which the mighty Saturn is replete. But it intellectually perceives the things above, and such as are beyond the celestial order. The mighty heaven, therefore, is allotted a kingdom, which is between the intelligible and intellectual orders. For the circulation mentioned in the Phaedrus is intelligence through which all the gods and souls obtain the contemplation of intelligibles. But intelligence is a medium between intellect and the intelligible. It must be said, therefore, that the whole of heaven is established according to this medium and that it contains the one bond of the divine orders, being the father indeed of the intellectual genus but being generated from the kings prior to it, which also it is said to see. But on one side of it is the super-celestial place, and on the other the sub-celestial ark, 
must be arranged. Now this whole paragraph is nothing other than what we have just previously sketched out. Uh, so in a way, reading this guy, you substitute, see? What's heaven? Hey, what's heaven? What's heaven? What's he, what does it really mean by heaven? All of it. Pardon me? All of it. No. Intelligible. What's heaven? No. See? Yeah. Intelligence. Intelligence. Well, you see, his word intelligence, his word intelligence is this action. Right? When this dude turns around and sees the nature of ultimate reality, sees what we are now talking about a short few minutes ago, right? that, that, right? this activity, this activity is intelligence. We called it intellecting. It is the intellect intellecting the, its, itself or the intelligible, right? So, let's put it this way. There's an eye of the soul, sometimes called intellect or noose, right? You say, when the intellect is intellecting the intelligible, that is intelligence. You're talking about this activity, which is similar in the physical world to seeing that you never see. That's heaven. Is that right? Come on, from the text. Is that heaven? Yes or no? Got a quote? Don't believe me. Got it? Heaven is the intelligence or intellectual perception of the first intelligibles. See, intellectual perception, intellect, perceiving the intelligible, that's what we're talking about. So this is the experience of pure light, divine radiance. So what's he going to do? He's going to take that and he's going to say, I'm going to call that Heaven. What are the intelligence? Then how do you get there? What's it like when you're there? What do you get for it? What do you have to do when you get off it? That's what he's going to deal with. So he's taking a mystical term. He's turning it into a metaphor. Heaven. You say, hey, you know what? How do you get there? Well, there are all kinds of people. Right, 12 classes of them. And you can arrange each class as if they are following a different Greek Olympian god. And they're all now trying to get this vision. You see, before that, before this experience, hey, there are a lot of things you can experience in meditation or whatever you're doing. And you're going around, having a lot of fun, seeing a lot of things, right? But when you want to get to that, that's a direct route. Hold your hat. That's what he wants to talk about. All right, so why don't we get into the text? And I'll so, it yeah, okay, back into it. But is heaven, that is heaven is the intelligence, is that... Is that a um, activity, or he, he calls it a kingdom? But in the act, it seems like there's an action in what you're talking about, and I'm not. That's sure. true. So both are true. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so they're both true. 
but intelligence is a medium between intellect and the intelligible. It must be said, therefore, that the whole of heaven is established according to this medium. And it contains the one bond of the divine orders, being the father indeed of intellectual genus, generated the kings prior to it, which is also said to see. See, another word for this, another word for this is chronos, mythical. So, I thought Kronos was higher than divine radiance or pure light. Am I? I, d I don't understand what you're doing. So, just do it louder and tell me what the point you want I to make. I thought. Oh well, I must be. Um, I thought Kronos was higher than the pure right. light or divine radiance. What about it? I thought Kronos was higher than pure light or divine. Okay, light. that's a good thing to think of. Okay. I mean, I don't know. Hold it in your back pocket and see whether it works out that way. That's all. With this eraser, I can change anything. Don't, don't worry about it. But wait a minute, Gina. If you find a nice quote that can nail your point down, let me have it. Otherwise, if you just tell me that's what you've been thinking, I'll say that's nice to think that way. And it's not that I was thinking. I just have a memory of it that thank way. Thank you. Anchor it so we can use it. No, thanks. I'll just listen. Okay. Regina, in regards to that question about activity, how about uh, the bottom of 244? Heaven's described as intellectually, it intellectually perceives. Is that an, that's an activity, right? Yeah. That's Pardon, true. What's the point you want to make? Uh, just regarding uh, the point that, the question that uh, Regina was asking before the point that she just made was, is this an activity? Is intelligence an activity or is heaven an activity? And, uh, Look, it is an activity and it is a state. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to root her in a quote. Huh. <coughs> it is an activity. See, it's a state. Yeah. This is dynamic. This is dynamic. It can be it can be infinitely expanded or penetrated or participated in. It's a state and yet it's dynamic. It's a process, yet it's a state. Okay. All right. Now, what's nice about this, look here. He's filling in something nice in here in the last sentence. Now, however you want to picture this, sir. Um, Okay, he's going to go into this, look here, in this, in this experience, right, in this experience, he's saying, by the way, uh, that's a bond of divine orders, so it's a bond of divine orders, he hasn't told us what's bound yet, but he's saying it's, it's generated from kings prior to it, and Kronos is generated from Uranus, heaven. It came prior to it. So, 
He's working right within Greek mythology. Okay, now look. Uh, within this now, we go back to those, see this order of beings? That's the bond of divine orders. And now he's going to go through what's above and what's below. What's above is the super celestial. and the sub. So notice the way he takes off then in the next chapter, chapter 6. These are the gods, they're leading, they're leading right, up to the super celestial. Therefore, the gods don't contain this, then this must be something that is perceived by following in one of the twelve orders that you identify with. Right? Agree? So therefore, thank you. Want to read? Well, I was actually had a question. Uh, so if if these are all states of mind, and uh, Zeus is also referred to as the demiurge. No, pardon me. These are states of mind. Ideal. These aren't states of mind. Oh. I'm these are, uh, excuse me, the states of, of uh, uh, state, I didn't mean it as, as you're taking it, as states of mind. They are uh, uh, characters basic, fundamental character of souls. And in that sense, states of mind. Okay? And these are the twelve gods. All men can be divided into these different categories called character of souls or states of mind. But they're all capable of reaching the top. Why is the demiurgos... Pardon me? Uh, why would the demiurgos be a Associated. I guess I don't really know what a demiurgos is. Zeus. <laughs> yeah, but what is what does that mean? What does which mean? Demiurgos. Ergos, as you know, in Greek is uh, work, and demi is uh, God, the God that works or creates. But you don't mean that, since you know that. That's what I thought it meant. Yeah. But, so, but what? what I'm curious about then is why is that? Why would the philosopher be the uh, as a the creator of the like of the natural world is that what the demiurge? Why would says? the philosopher be the creator of the natural world? Yeah. Why would the philosopher be the? Why would the philosopher be the creator of? The, I, I don't understand. Well, the, the I mean, why that why should Zeus. the follower why should the philosopher be in the camp of Zeus? Right. Well, uh, in terms of the cosmology. Uh, Zeus contemplates the idea in his mind that is this. That's this. And in contemplating that, he then uses that as a model for the universe, as a copy, as it passes through time. So, um, would you not agree? This action is a contemplation. That's this, contemplating. Isn't that what philosophers try to do? Right. Therefore? It may be fits. Yeah. Okay. And you'll do the next for us, please? Again, therefore, if indeed the super-celestial place is the imparticipable and occult genus of the intelligible gods, how can we establish so great a divine multitude there? And this accompanied with separation, for example, truth, science, justice,
temperance, the meadow, and adrastia, which is hestia. Is that right? Is adrastia the same as hestia? No. No? What is adrastia? Destiny. Destiny. Heard it referred to as Destiny. For neither do the fountains of the virtues, nor the separation and variety of forms, pertain to the intelligible gods. For the first and most unical of forms extend the demiurgic intellect of wholes to the intelligible paradigm and the comprehension of forms which is there. But Socrates in the Phaedrus says that a partial intellect contemplates the super celestial place. For this intellect is the governor of the soul as it is well said by the philosophers prior to us. If, therefore, it be necessary from this analogy to investigate the difference of intelligibles as the demiurgic intellect indeed, it is imparticipable. But a partial intellect is participable. So with respect to the intelligible, one, indeed, which is the first paradigm of the Demiurgus, pertains to the first intelligibles. But another, which is the first paradigm of a partial intellect, pertains to the second intelligibles, which are indeed intelligibles, but are allotted an intelligible transcendency, as subsisting at the summit of intellectuals. But if the super-celestial place is beyond the celestial circulation, but is inferior to those intelligible triads, because it is more expanded, for it is the plane of truth, and is not unknown, is divided according to a multitude of forms, and possesses a variety of powers. And the meadow which is there nourishes souls and is visible to them, the first intelligibles, illuminating souls with ineffable union, but not being known by them through intelligence. If this be the case, it is certainly necessary that the super celestial place should subsist between the intelligible nature and the celestial circulation. If Plato himself also admits that essence, which truly is, exists in this place, how is it possible that he should not also admit it to be intelligible and to participate of the first intelligibles? For because, indeed, it is essence, it is intelligible. But because it truly is, it participates of being. Moreover, possessing in itself a multitude of intelligibles, it will not be arranged according to the first triad. For the one being is there and not the multitude of beings, but possessing a various life which the meadow indicates it is subordinate to the second triad, for intelligible life is one and without separation. And again, since it shines forth to the view with divided forms, all various orders and prolific powers, it falls short of the all-perfect triad in intelligibles. If therefore it is the second to these in dignity and power, but is established above the celestial order, it is intelligible indeed, but is the summit of the intellectual gods. On this account also, nutriment is derived to souls from thence, for the intelligible is nutriment since the first intelligibles also, for example, the beautiful, the wise, and the good, are said to nourish souls. For by these, says Socrates, 
the wing of the soul is nourished, but by the contraries to these it is corrupted and destroyed. These things, however, are indeed affected by the first intelligibles exemptly, and through union and silence. But the super celestial place is said to nourish through intelligence. First, it shows you have the mythology diagram right here. Second, beliefs can be inferred from reading Plato's works. Two, three. At the psychology of the soul and its journey. Four, you have Plato's dialogues. He's taking these four things and in two paragraphs, weaving them together. So when you read it, you have to keep them separate and then pull them together so that you can follow what he's doing. Right. So he's going in back into the diagram, what we said over here. Right. He wants to establish the relationship between the idea of heaven and the super celestial sphere. He wants to then tell you what goes on there and how to relate to it, especially in terms of this experience. That's his goal. And he's going to try to do it by showing you Plato has it grasped mythically, metaphysically, and psychologically. That's what he's doing. So, what does it assume? We're now looking at two words, primarily heaven and super celestial. Agree? That's all we're doing. <clears throat> we're going to follow that language again and see how you can then piece together the second part, which is his metaphysical way, his language of describing it metaphysically, because he wants to show you this, how you then can use it for your own way of understanding the journey of the soul, and he wants to justify his thesis that all of this is in Plato. That's his goal. Now, there's a curious way sometimes to read metaphysics is backwards. What? Look, he thinks deductively, right, from the highest down. That's difficult because the higher is the most obtruse, it's sometimes difficult to fall very thin, as it were, right? The further you go down, it's easier to see what he's saying. So therefore, sometimes it's always better when you get a difficult passage to work backwards. <laughs> Do you think that's a good idea? Say, I don't know. I have a hard time doing that. No, 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 you have to have a hard time. <laughs> Look what he's doing. Yeah. Say, do it the other way. It's hard to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Look at if you have one, two, three, four, okay, then do it yeah. <laughs> in respect to this idea. I do it. He's doing it. So as it were, uh, Look at just the last sentence. The super celestial place is said to nourish through intelligence and energy and fill the happy choir of souls with intelligible light and the prolific rivers of life. Hey. So the super celestial place is a McDonald's. <laughs> it's where you get nourishment. Ah. Instead of hamburgers and french fries, what are they dishing out? Through intelligence and energy. Ah.
Now that means now you're picking up what he meant by intelli intelligence is what? Is that middle state. And to fill the happy choir of souls with intelligible light and prolific rivers of life. So this is also the source of life. Right? Prolific rivers of life and uh, fills happy choir of souls with intelligible life. That's what it does. So this uh, John? It's a choir. It's filling them with light. Oh, Isn't that right? Soul. Right? It nourishes them through what? Intelligence light. and energy. Intelligence and energy. Right? That's right. In other words, we're trying to picture that sentence. That's all we're doing. Which is a cashing out of the plane of truth, right? Pardon me? Which is Proclus' understanding of the plane of truth. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so we're going to get the yeah. Yeah. He, he called it that earlier, too. Yes, right, right, right. Um, these things, right, so therefore, um, uh, that's the end, that's the ending, that's what we said. So look here, that's where we're going. So therefore, we should be able to pick it up from the beginning. That's where we're going to end up. And he's going to add things to it, and the whole thing should be a coherent picture. See, um, suppose for a moment there were a couple of people who came out of some academy, Plato's Academy, or Zen training, or yoga center, and they all had this experience of luminous light. Right? Could it not be possible that someone might say, how do you account for that? Because, uh, wow, a uh, lot of energy, yeah, one says to the other, yeah. <laughs> and that's pretty nourishing, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, really participating in that uh, luminous light. Yeah. Well, where do you think it came from? Huh? I'm not allowed to ask that question. <laughs> well, suppose you're stupid and you keep asking it. Right? So Peter says, you know what? I'm going to give it a name. Super Celestial Place. So that's where it, it, that's where it's, that's the source of it. Oh, that's the source of it. Oh. Oh. Yeah. So, see, these answer questions that are often not even asked. Um, what are those? So let's go back into it and see, shall we? Um, We need to establish its place, its position, but super celestial place. Where would you find in those two paragraphs a place to to locate it? Like, but you were talking about the possible source of this. Uh, well, if there is such a source. Um, could there be something that can locate it in respect to something else? <clears throat> Where are you at? 
Josh. So we need a good quote. Come on, position. Place uh, between the intelligible nature <coughs> and celestial circulation. Yes, please go on. Well, it says here that um, the super celestial place should subsist between the intelligible nature and the celestial circulation. The few lines above the end. <coughs> between two places. Yes, but if the super celestial place is beyond the celestial circulation, but is inferior to those intelligible triads because it's more expanded, for it's the plane of truth. Oh, hey, I got a name for it. What is it? Plane of truth. Ah. Oh, I got a name for it. Oh. And it's not unknown. It's divided according to a multitude of forms and possesses a variety of powers. Right? Okay. It's got forms. Powers. And now he's adding something. And the meadow which is there nourishes souls and is visible to them. What does it produce? <coughs> Union. Um, it nourishes souls and visible to the first intelligibles illuminating souls with ineffable union, but not being known to them through intelligence. If this be the case, it's certainly necessary the super celestial place should be subsist between the intelligible nature and the celestial circulation. That's so that we'll leave that out. Um. <coughs> For because indeed it is essence is intelligible and because it truly is, it participates of being. Well, that's true. That's not too helpful. Um, we could read the beginning of the next chapter. So it's a it's a negative, but you can take it. Um, If this be the case, it is certainly necessary that the super celestial play should subsist between the intelligible nature and the celestial circulation. Now he keeps using the celestial circulation and we haven't unpacked it. Mm -hmm. see, see, the trouble with this is um, there's a whole bunch of ideas here. He's talking about each one in this passage. And he can't say everything at once. So there's also a circulation. He hasn't gotten to that, is it? But we need to get it. We need to get a lot. But if you hang in it, you can then fill it in as you go. Yes. There's no other way. Unless we could get... Uh, 
if it's possible to render it this way. Uh, sir, do you think this might work if we put all this together as a uh, DVD, kind of animate it and put it all together? You have to understand it first. I mean, if, if, if a lot of ebbs thrown in. <laughs> yeah, okay, just thought I'd ask. <laughs> He's into that. I'm trying to get him. Cool. Okay, look. Um, would you agree we're left with a question? What does he mean by the celestial circulation? Now, a good way to read this guy is any part or any idea that you're thinking about that holds you up because it's not clear because he hasn't covered it, forget everything else and go back and find out where he talks about it, recover that and put it in its place and then go on. In general, that's a good way of doing it. So, <coughs> so if you want at this point, we could say, hold it, let's make sure we follow what he means, right? We know what he means by intelligible, we got that. Huh. The circulation of the heavens. Uh, what would one see if it circulates? Why is it circulating? Hmm. Puzzles. Well, we either have to hold on to that because he's saying it's between two things and that's one of them. Well, it's nice to know it's between two things, but one of the things you don't know what he's talking about, should we just take it as a location and keep reading or go back and clarify it before we go on? Go back and clarify it before we go on. So, if it's back. In general, right? Anytime anybody is making a, uh, a statement, right? it is between X and Y, and you may now have an idea of Y, you don't know X. Well, you can keep on reading until you cover it, or go there and fill that in now. Whatever it is, this is always the case in metaphysics because he's always talking about where you can locate things and images and therefore he's moving back and forth. <clears throat> Here, in terms of the, the mythology, when Zeus creates the... the universe that engages time that is what that engages no. time no time only is engaged when it when he moves from the from the model to the copy no but what I'm saying is that because the super celestials abide outside of time right okay may we start thinking that the possibility of circulation is related to the concept that is introduced of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. See, hold that. Take any possibility you want and just hold on to it and see whether it answers the question. But, uh, see, if he did that, he would then be using an idea in his cosmology to solve a problem in his metaphysics, and that ain't allowed. Okay. Right, because this is, this is where he, he's, he's on the highest range of his metaphysics. He wants to explain that these three ideas, intellect, intelligence, and the intelligible, see, if the intelligible is the idea in the mind of God, that he contemplates to create, and you want to bring in the idea of time at that place, then we're giving this up, and we're talking about its role in creation or cosmology. Well, and that would be a different subject. But that's what I'm saying, is it says it's between the circulation and the upper celestial, and if that's the case, it needs to be outside of time. It is. That's, that's my... Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um. Because it has to be unchangeable. 
Mm-hmm. And when time is introduced, we've got a problem. Um, I thought you were bringing the celestial circulation into time, though. Well, but that's what I was trying to clear up in my mind, because then what Peter is saying is that we have to be careful not to interface the two. Don't get time involved with the metaphysics, because it is outside of time. Yeah, that's true. All right. Yeah. See, look, however, we're still talking about in this description the super celestial nourishing, aren't we? And we have to know what that means. All right, well, we have intelligence and energy. Before we go into the celestial heaven, uh, can we get more words on that? On what? The idea of the nutrient, okay? Because we're still here, and I'd just like to finish that before we go further. Yes, please. Uh, well, where we were reading before on the bottom of 245, it says, And the meadow which is, is there nourishes souls and is visible to them, the first intelligibles illuminating souls with ineffable union, but not being known by them through intelligence. So that's what it's filling them with. Mm-hmm. Okay, look. Look, see. Let's go back to these people. All right, they just had this experience. He's saying, you know what? Uh, what did they get for it? He said, well, they're nourished. Okay. <laughs> I believe you. Yeah, okay. But uh, what do you mean nourished? Well, um, they gained a certain, it's through intelligence and energy that they get this nourishment. Glad to hear it is through that, but what is it they're eating? And you would say? Beauty? What? Wisdom. Wisdom and? Justice. Right. Okay, look here. Hold just for a moment. Okay, look here. So what do these people gain from this experience? Oh my God! It's fantastically beautiful! Hey, it's good! Wise. There's some intelligibility in it. It's wisdom. That nourishes them, see. <clears throat> Look at people experience this in different cultures. Plato is looking back on it and he's saying, wait a minute, you know what? They gained some, it isn't just a light bulb. It's magnificently beautiful. <clears throat> There's wisdom with it. Hey, you know what? It's inherently it's good. By the way, those three together, you know what that is? That's the intelligible. That's mind itself. Oh! Look, he's trying to say these people then who experience this, they can agree, even if they are in Brooklyn. <laughs> right? That, hey, you know what? That was magnificently beautiful. No kidding. Yeah, yeah, wisdom. Yeah, and good. Right on, brother. Right? They're all saying the same thing. Plato is saying, I can now use these ideas and I can say another word for this unity of those three is the intelligible. Oh, that's what they are nourished on. Yeah. Oh. Uh, Not to in any way detract from those points that you just made, but if we even just stick within that sentence, actually to go along with those points, where the last sentence that you made us look at before, super celestial place is said to nourish through intelligence and energy, 
and to fill the happy choir of souls with intelligible light in the prolific rivers of life. Wouldn't that, wouldn't the intelligible light and the prolific rivers of yeah, light intelligible light. answer yeah. the question you pose? Yeah, I'm not sure I understand the point. What is it that feeds them? What are they feeding on? What are they feeding yeah, what's, on? What's the food? Well, she, she, uh, something happens to these people. Right? It isn't just like any other experience. They're nourished by it. By what? Is this a figurative way of talking about it? Or do such experiences nurture the people who experience it? Do they gain from it? Do they develop in some way? If so, then you have to, in some way, if you're staying with those words, say, with what? So he's saying, well, you know what? I, I tell you what, it's just but uh, Does it make any difference if someone has that experience and uh, says, oh, well, that was pretty nice. Uh, like, yeah, nice. <laughs> and someone else has the same experience and says, no, 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 no. I want to see whether I can better describe it, because if I can describe it, I can see it better. If I can see it better, then I can appreciate it better, and I can put it into a language I can use to talk to one another. That's the whole issue. Does it make any difference to the person who can use this kind of language among these people to share what it is they experience? Yes. And peace building, a vocabulary of mystical experiences. Putting it in terms of a myth, making philosophical dis language distinctions in it, so you can then use it for a psychological journey of the soul. So you too can try to get there, or discover it, or talk about it. That's his goal. So, uh, going back, okay? Uh, now, there's a part here which we don't have. Two parts, all right? I want another part. And again, since it shines forth to the view with divided forms in all various orders and prolific powers, it falls short of the all-perfect triad of the intelligibles. <coughs> if therefore it is the second of these in dignity and power, but it's established above the celestial order, it is intelligible indeed, but is the summit of the intellectual gods. Well, that's a heavy two sentences, isn't it? Take a look. <laughs> <laughs> Could you read it one more time here? Sure. I'm leaving the sentence about the meadow. But possessing a various life which the meadow indicates, it is subordinate to the second triad. Now, that means we have to now go back to the idea, principle of triads, and he's going to have three. Okay. Like, why he needs three triads, we can take a moment and talk about it, but let me hold that up for a moment, okay? And again, since it shines forth to the view with, hey, divided forms. See, these are not divided. These are not divided. So there is an experience where you can make these distinctions. Hey, you know what? That means there are different grades of experience. And some you can make, the <clears throat> make these distinctions and see that these terms are separated in other ways. No, you can't. There's a unity of them. Therefore, there are different levels of experience of the same thing. 
Oh. Oh, then they have different uh, orders and powers. Yeah, <laughs> that would follow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. If therefore it is the second of these in dignity and power, it's established above the celestial order and the intelligible, ah, but is the summit of the in intellectual gods. Look, <clears throat> um, whatever you say is, whatever you say is, has to have three things. You have to talk about it as something. That is. If it ain't dead, it's got some power or energy. If it's got some power or energy, then it can then act. There can be some activity that follows from it. Let's try it. One, two, three. Say, so, by the way, is there such a thing as the intellect? Yes. Oh, it must have a, must be something. It must have some power. It must have some activity, must it not? Hey, by the way, Intellect, when it's intellecting, when it's having that experience, right? When it's having that experience, intellecting, oh, that is something, isn't it? And therefore, must have some and must. So therefore, for each one of these, you can talk about its triad. Yeah, there are one, two, three triads. Because each one you can talk about it three ways, can't you? So you have to keep that in mind when he jumps back and forth and says the first triad, second triad, third triad. Because he mentions that earlier, the need to talk about triads and what's about them, why you can have a number of them and how you can order them and why some are higher and lower than others. So he's carrying that with him. We haven't touched that because it's an earlier book. See, this guy, this guy is like a uh, stonemason, right? He sets everything in place, see? And then on top of it, he puts another and another and another. He's a cr craftsman. He's building with sets of ideas from bottom up. Often the right way to read it is the other way around. Because we're more familiar with the other end. Right. Okay, so. Um, um, see, what's interesting, like, keep in mind What's really great in the Japanese system of Buddhism that they took over from China, and the Chinese had uh, six stages of enlightenment, and the Zen people brought in eight. Okay, that's the ox herding pictures. Eight, ten, but eight are of enlightenment experiences. That means you can make distinctions between very profound experiences. Okay. What language can you use to describe it? Could you put metaphors on them? Could you create a story about that? Yes, you could. They often use nature images from nature. Plato uses a mythology because a mythology can equally describe things if you're familiar with a mythology. And you can use a precise language for those eight and you're creating a metaphysics, which then you might be able to use for people then to return to try to understand that experience, understand it, describe it, label it, oh, you're in this, you're in that, you're in this, you're in that. 
Therefore, it's a typology, a two, isn't it? That's what he's doing. See, he just said, hey, this is one kind of experience, this is another. Do you see that right there in the chapter? Gosh, we ran over time. See, there's only one pair, one we do one show, one show, two pages. Oh. Want to do any more of this? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Um, now remember, you have fountains that shine forth, then illuminating things, and you can you can position them. What are you going to do? They're going to try to create a map of a spiritual journey. And within that, there are different states of mind that are experienced. You should be able then to see what terms fit each one. And possibly, possibly, if there are people who are having the same kind of experience, but with different degrees, is it possible that we could talk about the same type of experience with different degrees using different terms to distinguish them? That's what he's doing. Therefore, what's the most important thing to remember? There's a few beers in the refrigerator. Thank you. That girl is a good...